Hello everybody, welcome along to today's webinar. My name is Jamie Clayton, I'm Operations Director here at Freeman Technology in the UK and we are obviously part of the wider Micrometics Instrument Corporation um, and I will be your host and moderator for today's presentation which is testing powders at elevated temperatures and your speaker for today is Laura Shaw. Uh, before I give you a little bit more background on uh, Laura, um, just a few housekeeping tips for today's event. You'll notice that when you joined, all attendees are in listen only mode. So if you want to get in touch, you can ask us a question using the icon in the ON24 console. Um, so just drop us a line on there. We will see those real time during today's event and we'll att attempt to answer as many as we can in 10 to 15 minute session at the end of the presentation. Um, rest assured that if your uh, question isn't addressed, one of our applications team will be in touch in the coming days to do so. Uh, you can also use the link to send us an email if you want to get in touch that way. You'll notice as well that there's the ability to, to download resources so um, and some material, some literature has been made available that's relevant to today's topic for you to download and read at your leisure. And you can also download a certificate of attendance. At the end of the session, there will be a, a very short survey, um, which we'd be really grateful if you could spend a few moments just to complete. Just helps us to really tailor these sessions and make sure that we're addressing topics that are of interest to, uh, to a wider audience. So as I say, be really grateful if you could take a few minutes just to answer that at the end of session. If you do have any technical issues at all, um, there's a help icon within the console. Click on that. That will give you some answers to some, um, to some common problems. And worst case scenario, you can speak directly to a ON24 representative. Um, today's event is being recorded. Uh, so a link will be sent out within the coming days with uh, a recording to the event that you can watch on demand or share with your colleagues. So uh, keep an eye on your inbox for that. This is uh, part of a series of uh, webinars that will be held over the, the coming months over the course of this year. So again, keep an eye on your inbox. There'll be details of, uh, of those coming through to you on a regular basis. Or also you can use the, the link that you use to register for today's event to have a look at upcoming events and uh, register for any of those in advance. So as I mentioned, today's speaker is Laura Shaw. Uh, Laura is an application specialist based at Freeman Technology here in the UK as well. She has a master's in chemistry from the University of Birmingham, where she specialised in organic synthetic chemistry. She joined the Freeman team back in 2016 and she provides technical support and application support to users of Freeman Technology powder testing products, right from pre-sale information to ongoing education and uh, application and technical support during, their, during the lifetime of the instrument. So with that, I will hand over to Laura and join you again for the question and answer session at the end. Over to you, Laura. Thanks, Jamie. Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining our webinar today. As Jamie mentioned, the topic of today's discussion is testing powders at elevated temperatures. So first of all, we are all aware of how widely powders are used throughout such a wide range of sectors and industries. And all of those different processes in which the powders are handled within operate at different temperatures. In spite of that, powders are already challenging materials their flow properties can vary significantly depending on how the material is handled, whether that's at different stress levels, different flow regimes. And therefore, when we start to introduce temperature, this is an additional complexity and variable that we need to consider. If we cannot understand how the powder can flow and flow under our process relevant conditions, and this obviously can lead to things like stoppages and downtime. Um, but ideally, if we can understand how a powder flows under very process relevant conditions, no matter what those conditions are, then that obviously gives us the tools to be able to optimise process efficiency and the quality of our products. So if we first consider powder flow under ambient conditions and how complex that can be, we'll of course be moving on to our variable of temperature very soon and throughout the rest of this webinar. But first of all, I just want to consider how many properties of a solid particle can influence powder flow. We have a list here, there are a number of different variables here, but this is by no means a complete list. Um, and if we start to understand how complex a powder is, its flow performance can be influenced by any one of these parameters that can sometimes be difficult to control and also difficult to measure. And as well as considering all those variables of the solid particles, it's also necessary for us to consider that powders are also bulk materials. They also contain liquids, typically in the form of capillary bonding on the surface of particles, and also entrained gases. And the way in which these three different phases will interact 
obviously the properties of each can also influence our powder behavior. So what do we actually mean by powder behavior? We can see here we've put together almost an equation showing powder behavior as a function of all of these different variables. These are variables, properties of our solid particles, but also of the entire bulk system, those other phases that we've just discussed. If it were possible though to actually control all of these variables and perhaps create a powder and two powders that are identical, where all of these properties were kept the same, there also could be variation introduced between them by their environmental conditions. Powders are very sensitive to the conditions at which we handle them within. So this obviously includes environmental conditions such as humidity and temperature, but also variables such as the level of consolidation, the applied load to a material, uh, any aeration effect that's been introduced into the powder bed, things like our shear and strain rates, um, and also its flow against different surfaces. So powders can indeed be complex, but it's now time to introduce an extra variable of elevated temperature. I have just here a few examples of when powder may be subjected to these different conditions and why this is a relevant variable for us to study. Powders can be stored under different environmental conditions. This can be due to fluctuations in temperature from different climates around the world, from day-night cycles, and also uh, within highly controlled storage environments. Heat can be generated from friction, from process equipment. I have a few examples here, so for blending and mixing, drying, uh, and also during milling. Some components may need to be heated to ensure they're in a more manageable state for processing. And when we introduce, sorry, when we increase the temperature of one component, we need to understand how that influences uh, the entire blend. And finally, there are many processes where the temperature is intentionally increased. So whether this is to improve drying performance, increase reactivity, or also elongate the stability of various components. So here we have some more specific examples as well throughout different industries. Got here an example for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the process of melt granulation and hot melt extrusion. We'll actually be taking a look at a uh, closer example of these in one of our case studies. Uh, in powder metallurgy and polymers, obviously during additive manufacturing, it's often standard practice to heat the temperature of a feedstock to closer to its melt temperature so that there is less of a gradient during uh, processing. We've also got the example here of hot isostatic pressing. If in the chemical industry, um, of course, optimising the reaction rate may involve changing those temperature conditions, whether increasing or decreasing them, uh, and also undergoing heat treatments, uh, sometimes required alongside the use of catalysts. And finally, during, obviously, within the food industry, pasteurization and dehydration of different materials requires the use of those elevated temperatures. So let's consider how those elevated temperatures are going to influence powder flow. And let's first take a look at how they can impact our solid particle properties. So in several of those operations, the particles may be heated beyond their glass transition temperature. So what does that mean? So it is that transition where a powder does go from a glass-like brittle state to become much more soft, uh, sorry, much softer and more ductile. That can obviously have a permanent impact on morphology and obviously on the surface properties and this transition can of course change those interparticular interactions the strength of those uh, cohesivity and adhesivity um, and also can mean that particles can be in some form permanent bonds as they start to fuse together and as well as the impact on the solid particles let's also take a look at how those elevated temperatures influence the bulk properties uh, so obviously see here with our solids we've seen that glass transition temperature some thermal deformation that can take place and also in particular powders the effects on the fat content within that uh, those particles as well. The liquid entrained within the powder bed can of course be influenced by elevated temperatures whether that uh, includes its evaporation and therefore the reduction in capillary bonding as a result um, and also the influence on uh, entrained gas so of course influencing the pressure of that gas the changing it changes in the moisture content of any air, any gas which is uh, surrounding our particles uh, and also a change in that density. So we've seen there how changes in temperature can influence so many different, different aspects of a powder from the particles all the way through into that bulk system and therefore that those changes in temperature can subsequently affect our performance within different uh, processes functioning at different environmental conditions.
However, as we saw previously, there are lots of different conditions that we do need to consider to make sure that we are testing a material in a process relevant way, especially because it is so they are so sensitive to those different conditions. So whether that those are environmental from temperature and humidity through to different flow regimes that the powder is subjected to um, and also different applied stresses different applied loads and the level of consolidation as well. So here is the FD4 powder rheometer. It's considered as a universal powder tester due to its ability to subject powders to different types of flow, different flow regimes, and subject them to different stresses and quantify their performance within those different settings. We can see here on the right uh, an assortment of different accessories which are used with the instrument to subject that powder to those different conditions. In order to achieve those wide range of different types of stress and flow regimes, FD4 has a wide range of methodologies. So they're typically divided up into three different categories um, with on the left at dynamic flow uh, methodologies, studying the powder's resistance to flow and the introduction of a number of different variables there to measure as a function of those. Uh, bulk properties, measuring compressibility, permeability, uh, and also density as a function of different applied stresses. And then the final category, shear on the right there, it actually measures the powder's uh, resistance to the onset of flow. So after a powder has been consolidated, how do those powders uh, begin to flow again, looking at the failure between two layers of consolidated material flowing against each other. So let's take a look at our first case study. So I'm going to focus, first of all, on the pharmaceutical industry and looking at the sensitivity of different excipients. There are a number of different pharmaceutical processes that do optimise the sensitivity of different materials to elevated temperatures. We've got a few examples here from the use of these hot melt techniques to produce uh, extrudates uh, and coating. Uh, but the process we're actually going to focus on is melt granulation. So melt granulation optimises the use of this thermosetting binder in order to form granules, so in order to nucleate and for those granules to grow. Um, this does have many advantages in the way that it is a water-free process, so it's very suitable um, for different materials, especially APIs that are water or solvent sensitive. Um, it does, however, mean, though, that we I need to subject those materials to elevated temperatures. Um, the temperature range that's typically required is somewhere between 50 and 90 degrees Celsius to actually melt that thermosetting binder. Um, of course, it's necessary to consider what impact that temperature has on the rest of the blend. So of course, on potentially very sensitive APIs um, and also on the excipients themselves as well, and especially on the powder flow properties of those. So, we're going to be focusing on these two excipients, so on granulac uh, 70 and granulac 140. Uh, these are obviously very common excipients, and we're going to be studying how does those elevated temperatures influence their flow properties when these materials are heated during those hot uh, melt granulation processes. What influence does that really have on their subsequent performance? So. In order to analyse these materials at elevated temperatures, we are going to be using the FD4 powder rheometer, and we're going to be studying flow properties, so dynamic flow properties, uh, when subjecting those materials to temperatures between 25 and 100 degrees Celsius at different increments, so heating those at 30 minutes each. Um, and also we're going to be focusing on one of the excipients and understanding the sensitivity to heating for different time periods after being heated to 80 degrees Celsius. So when we're referring to dynamic testing with the FD4, just have some examples uh, and some images to show you here. So the FD4 uses a twisted blade to measure the resistance to flow of a powder bed. So the instrument uses a combination of a measurement of torque on the spindle and also force from a load cell beneath the base of the instrument um, in order to actually quantify a flow energy, the powder's resistance to flow. And we have a short video here just showing this twisted blade moving down through the powder bed. It moves down in a helical pathway, helical motion, and during that traverse, of course, torque and force are being measured um, and we're calculating a flow energy value. So let's look at those materials sensitivity to that increase in temperature. Our ambient conditions were at 25 degrees Celsius, as we can see here, heating all the way up to 100 degrees.
we can see that both of these materials are indeed sensitive uh, to the changes in temperature. So this type of technique can be used to understand are my materials sensitive? Some materials, of course, may not be sensitive to heating uh, within this range, whereas some may be highly sensitive, understanding that magnitude so that when changes are being made to different uh, process conditions that can be considered. Uh, but also this enables us the opportunity to understand what is our resistance to flow at those elevated temperatures? How do those materials now rank now that we're handling them under different conditions? So we can see that up to around 60 degrees Celsius, both of those powders displayed flow energy values that were quite stable. However, beyond that temperature, we can see this nonlinear relationship between flow energy and temperature. We can also see a very small decrease in flow energy uh, between 25 and 40 degrees Celsius for granulac 140. So it's potentially, it's potentially due to a reduction in capillary bonding from the heating of those samples and potentially some drying of those materials. It's also of interest to see here the relative change um, in flow energy as a function of temperature. And we can see here that granulac 70 was the most sensitive to that increase um, with around a, over 90% increase in the flow energy. So as well as understanding the variable of temperature, it's also of interest to see how does the time spent at that temperature, the storage time um, at those elevated temperatures influence our flow properties. We've taken here our sample of, of granulac 140 and we can now starting to understand what impact does heating have over a period from zero, so under ambient conditions and fresh powder, all the way through to storage after four hours. So our previous measurements were completed after 30 minutes, whereas we can see here that the uh, flow energy does continue to increase if that time period is extended. This is also something that we might need to consider. So we've seen that positive correlation between temperature and flow energy that we're measuring for our two granulac excipients, obviously indicating that as that temperature increases, um, we're seeing an increase in the resistance to the dynamic confined flow that we're quantifying with our flow energy. Um, this is, of course, one trend that we see. This isn't the case for all materials. We can see unusual relationships between the two. We can see, sometimes see a decrease in flow energy even as that temperature rises. We've obviously seen these different sensitivities for these two different materials. And of course, also we need to consider that um, additional variable as well of the storage time at elevated temperatures, which we saw for the granulac 140 um, was also having an influence uh, on our flow properties. So we've seen for these materials that even though they have the same chemical composition, they are still displaying different responses to the change in temperature. And this is just highlighting the fact that this is a complex relationship here. Um, we know that numerous different properties can influence this sensitivity. And again, just highlighting the importance of a more process relevant uh, analysis of our materials. And really finally, we're demonstrating how when we are changing the conditions of our process, whether that is through heating our materials in the melt granulation process or several of the other applications that we saw that use elevated temperatures, we need to consider how that change in conditions is influencing the different components of our blend. So not just the API, which is often um, obviously perceived as being very sensitive to these conditions, but also how that's going to impact the excipients and their flow properties. Our next case study is focusing on the reuse of powdered feedstocks used in additive manufacturing. For many additive manufacturing AM processes, it's necessary for material to be recycled. So powder that doesn't make up part of the final part. For, in order for this process to be economically viable, we need to be able to recycle that and be able to print with that again. However, that recycled material may have very different flow properties to the virgin powder. We have some examples here of why that might be. So whether that powder contains splatter, so basically larger particles of melted powder, whether we have changes in particle shape, whether that is a removal of, for example, satellites on metallic powder particles um, or changes in, in the surface properties. So our real question within this case study is, can recycled material be reused effectively? Can it be mixed with virgin powder to actually improve its performance and to be able to ensure that that powder can perform in a satisfactory way comparable to a virgin material?
We have an example here of a powder bed fusion PVF process, um, just a rough schematic to explain what we're talking about here. We can see on our powder bed, we're starting to print the word technology of Freeman technology, but we can see how much of that powder has been sintered um, and actually how much of that powder is going to be reused. That material has still been subjected to elevated temperatures, but therefore how is that going to impact its performance in those subsequent cycles? Our case study is focusing on six different samples, looking at a variety of different ratios of virgin and used material. We're again going to be quantifying the flow performance of these powders using the FT4 dynamic flow measurements as seen in our previous case study. And as a final aspect of the study, we're going to be trying to understand whether if we sieve powders um, that potentially contain splatter, so sieving our used powders, does that return those flow properties back into a similar state as a virgin material? Let's take a look at our results. So on our plot here on our y-axis, we have basic flow energy this is the powder's resistance to a confined but dynamic flow. And we see those greatest differences in flow energy between our 100% virgin and 100% used material. Those are the fourth and the sixth bars from the left. And really that's not too much of a surprise to us. However, what may be a little bit surprising is the trend between the ratio of components between virgin and used material and flow energy, as shown for the first three bars on the left of our plot. We see that that relationship is not, certainly not linear, but also is non-monotonic. We can see that it's actually our 75% virgin material, 25% used, uh, which is most similar to the virgin powder which again may be expected due to the higher proportion of virgin material, but it's actually that 50-50 blend which contains uh, the highest flow energy out of all of those blended samples. This is indeed showing us that it is not always necessarily possible to predict flow performance based on the component ratio of our blend. So let's take a look at the results from the second part of our study, which was looking at is it possible to try and reverse the effects of the reuse of powder uh, by sieving? So if we can remove those larger particles of splatter, so splatter that's introduced from the melt pool, uh, typically large particles of melted material, um, if we remove those, can, does that powder return back to a similar state to our virgin blend? Well, taking a look at our plot, uh, our 100% used and also sieved and then the 100% used blend are actually shown on the right of our graph and we can see that they generated comparable flow energy data indicating that unfortunately it wasn't um, sieving wasn't sufficient to return those used powders back to a similar state to the virgin material so even though that splatter has been removed we are still seeing significant changes in the flow energy as a result of reuse and the recycling of that material. So it's obviously indicating that there are other changes that are taking place here, um, likely due to changes in the particle surfaces and potentially particle morphology. Our final case study is going to be focusing on additive manufacturing again, but this time the focus is going to be on polymer feedstocks. For this particular study, I'd like to give special thanks for the team at RICO, uh, the printing specialists. Powders are subjected to low stress conditions in additive, additive manufacturing techniques. And this means, again, we need to be considering the process relevancy of any powder characterization that we are using. On top of ensuring that powders are being characterized in a way that's relevant to the stresses and the flow regimes that they experience in that process, again, we need to consider that additional variable of temperature. Uh, during printing, powders can still be heated to close to their glass transition temperature, even if they're not being sintered and, of course, forming part of that final part. Our case study is focusing on two polymer feedstocks. Um, their performance under ambient conditions is very similar, uh, but under those higher temperature conditions of the printer, they do differ quite significantly. We can see that polymer A has acceptable printing performance. I'm going to be comparing that against polymer B. Um, this has displayed poor part quality, and especially when that feedstock is recycled. So why, why is this the case? Um, we're going to be using the FT4 as our characterization tool to explore that. The polymers are characterized using a number of different methodologies from the FT4. Um, these are all classes ambient tests, uh, meaning that they were completed at the ambient temperature conditions. The first analysis we have here is uh, using the FT4 shear cell, 
This methodology involves critically consolidating a powder uh, and following that consolidation, uh, quantifying how readily that powder begins to flow again. So how readily it transitions from a consolidated state to a dynamic state. That heavily consolidated conditions may not necessarily be uh, very process relevant to the low stress environment of during additive manufacturing. And we can see here that powders A and B displayed very comparable performance here, suggesting that their flow properties under high stress conditions are comparable. The polymer feedstocks were also characterized using much lower stress uh, characterization techniques. Uh, we have here the FT4 aeration methodology, uh, which quantifies uh, the powder's sensitivity to the introduction of air at a range of different air velocities. As we can see on the plot on the left here, um, we are still measuring a total energy in a similar way to how we were in our previous case, case studies, measuring the powder's resistance to flow as a blade was down through that material in its helical uh, motion. We can see that that total energy decreases as our air velocity increases, so as our particles uh, can be lifted and separated and lubricated by the airflow. Again, we can see very comparable performance between powders A and B. This plot does actually also have error bars on it. Continuing with our dynamic flow characterization of these feedstocks, we were measuring flow energy. So this time, not with the introduction of air, just measuring our flow energy, our powder's resistance to uh, confined dynamic flow. Again, a comparable performance is observed here. And we are also quantifying a specific energy. This value is measured as the blade moves upwards through the powder bed and quantifies the resistance to uh, unconfined flow. We can see here that powder B does display slightly higher specific energy values, indicating that this powder has higher interlocking and friction. Permeability was also quantified uh, using the FT4. This is now one of the bulk methodologies of the instrument, um, and we're quantifying how readily air can permeate through the powder bed at a function of different normal stresses. Our permeability data does show that powder A is slightly more permeable, indicating that air can pass through more readily through this powder bed. This is especially relevant during additive manufacturing, where we are indeed trying to form thin uniform layers of powder on the fabrication bed. Uh, any air voids and air pockets that are trapped in between those layers can lead to defects. And so understanding how readily air can pass through and permeate through layers of powder is indeed very relevant here. We have indeed seen some differences between powder A and powder B and ambient conditions, but they were not large. Um, so let's take a look at what happens when we heat that material up to its processing temperature of 113 degrees Celsius. So we have here flow energy on our y-axis, as we've seen with several others of the case studies, quantifying that powder's resistance to flow. And we can see here a nonlinear relationship between temperature and our flow energy. Again, meaning that it can be difficult to predict how a powder is going to perform at different temperatures without completing that process relevant analysis. So let's also take a look at cooling of these powders. So what happens when we those materials return back to ambient conditions from that processing temperature of 113 degrees? We can see that the flow energy of powder A, which is in blue, returns back very closely to the initial flow energy, indicating that when this material is heated, um, we do not see a significant hysteresis um, and the properties of the heated and potentially recycled powder can be very similar of the, the fresh uh, virgin material. However, for powder B, we actually observe a hysteresis for this sample. The flow energy values may not have reached as higher uh, values they did at the elevated temperature of 113 degrees, as we see with powder A. But when we cool that material down, uh, we do see that hysteresis and there is an increase between uh, the ambient performance of our fresh material, the virgin material, versus after it has been heated. We can also display our data in a bar chart here to more easily compare uh, the flow energy under ambient and processing conditions and also following cool down. For powder A, we've seen how even though its flow energy was slightly higher under the processing temperature, uh, those changes were in fact uh, close to being fully reversible.
Whereas for powder B, we observed that hysteresis between flow energy and uh, processing or testing temperature. And we've therefore seen that how each time the powder is heated, its resistance to flow potentially continues to increase. And this is likely the result of those processing issues that were occurring uh, during printing and why the performance um, was actually worsened after recycling of this powder. This case study has therefore shown uh, how the heating materials to cross their processing temperature is indeed important for process relevant analysis, but also how the cooling between uh, our processing environment and ambient temperatures can give us useful information to show how the powder um, may perform following recycling and for subsequent cycles and for subsequent processing. So to conclude, um, we've obviously seen how powders are very complex materials, even under ambient conditions. We've seen the vast number of properties that can influence their performance. Uh, and that's before we even start to change and modify their storage or processing temperature. We've also seen how it's not only the solid particles of a powder that are influenced by the change in temperature, but also the liquid and the gas phases. Even materials that are very similar and as we saw with our uh, pharmaceutical excipients, they can have very different sensitivities to elevated temperature, uh, meaning that it's not always very easy to predict performance at elevated temperature and obviously encouraging uh, the, the use of a more process relevant analysis. And of course, to be able to uh, use our, whether it's feedstocks in AM or our uh, pharmaceutical excipients uh, very effectively under a range of different conditions and under a variety of different applications that subject those powders to different temperatures. It's obviously important to understand their responses to those environments to allow us to predict that performance uh, and ultimately optimise those situations. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Uh, Jamie and I will be very happy to take many of your questions that might have been submitted during the session. But thanks very much. Thanks for that, Laura. Great presentation. Um, just, uh, just a note uh, to apologise. I think that uh, there was some of our attendees experienced some technical difficulties during the presentation. So um, if that happened to you and you're still with us, apologies for that. Um, we have had a technician from ON24 looking into the reasons why. Um, but I think some people did lose audio and or uh, the slides moving along. So if that did happen to you, like I say, apologies. Um, hope it didn't um, ruin too much of the presentation. Hope it didn't start too early. But a recorded version will be sent out in the next couple of days. Um, so you'll have a link to that and can uh, listen again uh, at your leisure or even share with colleagues. So yeah, apologies if that did happen to you. Um, Laura, as I say, thank you. Great presentation. Can you hear me? Are you uh, on the line? I can, yeah. Thanks, Jamie. No problem. Um, so we have had a few questions come in. Um, so let's uh, let's start with some of those. So the first one is asking, what, what would you suggest are the uh, key methodologies for understanding powder flow behaviour in additive manufacturing applications? Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, through some of the case studies, we mostly focused on the dynamic methodologies and the stress levels through those tests are really the most relevant for the low stress kind of deposition onto the fabrication bed that we had it have in say uh, powder bed fusion um, and also the distribution of that powder into a thin layer with a, a roller. So parameters such as basic flowability energy, BFE or specific energy, SE from those dynamic methodologies, they quantify uh, the resistance to dynamic flow. Um, and also focus on the friction and the interlocking of particles at, at lower stresses. So obviously those methodologies, um, but I'd also want to mention the permeability as well. So really focusing on the formation of uniform layers, which is of course paramount uh, during additive manufacturing. And we of course don't want air voids and pockets beneath those layers, between those layers. And so being able to understand how air can actually escape and make sure that we don't form those and don't form any defects and, and quality issues. That's also going to be important too. Okay, thanks for that. Um, just just to add as well, something um, from from my own experience uh, to answer that question, um, and perhaps a surprising one that um, did have some FT4 users in additive manufacturing that found compressibility was really important. Um, 
because of how powder is compact against the face of the, the roller or the recoater as it's spreading across the build chamber. Um, they're not something that's um, as, as influential perhaps as the dynamic measurements or the permeability measurements that Laura mentioned. They're absolutely critical to that layer building process. But yeah, the compressibility can, um, can also be quite influential because of that, that forcing the powder to move across the bed and how it compacts against the face. Okay, so uh, thanks for that one, Laura. The next question that we have is, could you talk a little bit more about which FT4 tests can be undertaken with a heated powder? Uh, yeah, we can, yeah, sure. So as we've seen in the, the case studies, most of the focus was on the, the dynamic uh, methodologies, so obviously measuring a, a flow energy, that resistance to flow uh, with the FT4's twisted blade. Um, when we do uh, complete test with, with heated powder, something we obviously need to consider is, is the cooling rate of that material. So tests that are quicker, so quick test cycles, um, as, as we've seen in the case study, are really the, a great option there. Um, we can also then take a look potentially at, at the rate of, of cooling as well um, with a longer program. Uh, it doesn't mean though that I think the tests really need to be limited to the dynamic methodologies. We could also perhaps introduce the, the bulk methodologies there, so perhaps compressibility, looking at how the, the density changes as, as we apply different loads. Okay, excellent. Um, could, could you do that similarly if you were doing compressibility? Could you also run a permeability test on a, on a heated powder maybe? Uh, yeah, sure, I think you could. Yeah, we'd, we'd really, really focus on, I think, a shorter test, um, just looking at perhaps uh, one or two uh, applied loads rather than the standard test, which, which looks at quite a wide range, but yeah, certainly. Okay, so just going straight to your target stress rather than a profile on the way. Exactly, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay understood, thanks. Okay, um, and uh, our next question, I've got a couple of long similar lines actually to this, so I'll try and put them into one question, but um, how could you um, investigate caking under different environmental conditions? Yeah, so yeah, it's a really good question um, and definitely a, an interesting topic uh, for us. Uh, so we do actually have methodologies with the SG4 that allow us to kind of quantify the effects of extended storage periods. Um, so the way those methodologies typically work is that the powder is prepared on instruments, so conditioned using one test, and then the powder within its vessel is removed from the instrument and stored under desired conditions for an extended period, so hours or, or perhaps several days. Um, and during that time, the powder could be subjected to different humidity levels and different temperatures, uh, perhaps with the drawing that vessel inside an environmental chamber or within the storage environment, uh, which I was trying to study. Um, the temperatures perhaps in, in that setting are going to be closer to ambient conditions really to try and simulate that storage environment. Uh, but after that, the, the vessel can be introduced back onto the instrument. We quantify the, the change in flow properties as a result of that storage or as a result of those conditions. Um, because the FT4 uh, has the functionality to be able to measure those properties at different heights throughout the vessel, we can also see whether that's the a property or the caking is uh, homogeneous or not. So you can really go in, in quite a bit of detail there. Okay, all right. So you can pretty much take your powder away from the instrument, do whatever you want to it, and bring it back and quantify the impact. Exactly, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, and you touched briefly on there on uh, on the non-homogeneous caking. Um, and there ha like I say, there has been one or two questions on caking in particular. So um, there'll obviously be some details of this come through uh, into your inbox in the coming weeks, but... Um, Keep your eyes out for a presentation from uh, another one of our application specialists, Rajiv Datani, who will be talking about the measurement of caking in powders. Uh, I think that's on the 20th of October, so uh, you can register for that now on the same link you used for this webinar, or uh, keep your eyes out for more details in your, in your inbox. So if that's of interest, uh, have a look at that. Um, looking further onto our questions then, Laura. Um, in your experience, do powders always flow less readily when subjected to higher temperatures? Um, I guess the simple answer is, is, is no, <laughs> they don't. Um, so the powders can respond in quite a few different varied ways to heating. Um, I think we saw in it to a small extent with our, 
excipients case study where there was a slight decrease in flow energy um, for one of the, the granulac excipients, about 40 to 60 degrees Celsius. Um, so starting to, to demonstrate that that increase in temperature doesn't always cause a kind of an increase in the resistance to flow. Uh, we know that heating can, of course, cause a, a drying effect, so reducing the capillary bonding, um, but also that heating, the effects it can have on, on surface texture, uh, surface chemistry, and the morphology of the particles, as we saw, when, especially when we get above a, a glass transition temperature, uh, can, can be really quite varied, and, and that doesn't necessarily uh, cause an issue with flow. It could mean that a powder becomes more free-flowing as well. Okay, excellent. Yeah, there's, there's one or two questions that have come in along those similar lines. I think you've addressed them all there, and in particular, um, <clears throat> there were a couple that asked about the, the drying effect and whether that could improve the flow properties. So, um, yeah, thanks for touching on that. I think you've uh, answered that question as well. Um, just uh, one more question, I think. Um, Somebody is asking, could we study elevated temperature using the, the uniaxial powder tester as well? Oh, um, yeah, sure. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, the, the UPT, the, the uniaxial powder tester, um, we do actually have a, an accessory called the consolidation station. Um, and so that allows powders to be stored for extended time periods uh, and under applied loads at the same time. Uh, so we can go up to about 100 kilopascals. And at the same time as, as that storage under, under load, you could also expose those materials to different humidity conditions and also elevated temperatures. Uh, we can go up to 70 degrees Celsius with the, with the UPT there. And obviously those conditions, like humidity and temperature, uh, can be from an accompanying oven or an environmental chamber as well. But obviously then, then allows you to combine applied load and then also looking at conditions during the storage as well. Uh, very, very good question there. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah, and um, just for anybody not familiar with the UniAxial Powder Tester, when you receive the link for, um, for today's presentation, there'll be the link to historical webinars as well, which does include one on the, uh, the UniAxial Powder Tester if you want to learn, to learn more about that topic and that product. Okay, um, I think that actually addresses all of our questions, or there were quite a few along similar lines that came in, and I think they've all been addressed by what you've, uh, what you've had to say. So um, thanks very much for that, Laura. Great presentation. Thanks for taking all the, uh, the questions and addressing them so well. Uh, and thanks to everybody for attending. Thanks for taking the time to join. Um, as I say, apologies for those of you that did experience any technical issues, but um, the recorded version will be made available in the next few days. And if there's any questions you do have on, uh, on this topic or anything else to do with powder flow and powder behavior, then don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with us, um, as mentioned at the start, by email um, or via our website. Um, and you can also learn more about the products at micrometrics.com or freemantechnology.co.uk. But uh, with that, I'll uh, wish you all goodbye. Thanks again, Laura, and thanks everybody for attending. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.